Greetings, stranger, and welcome to the Ivy District. Absalom's smallest area is always a hub for brouhaha and high drama, and I mean that in at least three different ways, not least literally. Here, you will find artisans and artists jostling for the attention of an up-and-coming bourgeoisie. If you are searching for entertainment and tourism, the Ivy District is, without a doubt, your most reliable locale in Absalom, because it comes with all the bells and whistles necessary to support a burgeoning theatrical economy. Hop onto the carriage, and let your eyes wander for a moment. Note how practically every street in view has a designated stage for musicians and thespians, and is also lined with the shading trees that grant the district its name. Look at the diversity of clothing adorning every character here, from the practical to the practically naked, and those are students, fear not, we'll get to them soon enough. Notice also the disproportionate number of elves, half-elves, and leshies here. Oh, those would be the plant-based humanoids, in case you were uninitiated. And finally, listen to that music. It can be quite the cacophony to the unprepared, especially after the relative quiet of Sleepy Westgate. But do not worry, because I have commissioned some travelling minstrels to follow our carriage and provide us with tailored ambience this afternoon. My treat. Well then, without further ado, let's begin. One, two, three. Now let's begin with a bit of orientation. This is Flower Street, the main thoroughfare that bisects the district into east and west halves. The road, beginning at the border with Westgate, is wide enough to accommodate two large carriages, and is flanked by proud oak and willow trees on both sides, all the way to the Wise Quarter. Uh, to follow it straight would make for quite a short route, and we would miss many of the Ivy District's most engaging points of interest, so instead I'm going to steer us eastwards to journey down the long axis of the famous Ivy District Park. Then we'll swing upwards again and loop all the way around and down to the west side of the district before ending our tour exactly where we started. Well, it's quite busy today. Well, the vendors are in full swing in the mid-afternoon, manning the endless lines of shops, boutiques, stalls and stands that make up the Flower Street Market. This is an all-purpose and all-service commercial hub that will offer something for everyone visiting the district, but it caters especially to the tourists that scramble up here each day. Consequently, the market does place a particular emphasis on the district's strengths, namely artisanal craftsmanship and artwork. It is something of a rite of passage for Absalom's wealthy to commission a portrait of themselves on this street, uh, capturing the unmistakable trees and finery of Flower Street behind them. And this is also one of the few areas of the district where the street performers are not harassed by the thistle guard for juggling or busking without a permit. You see, the nomarch of this district is an accomplished bard called Elaine Always, and uh, he has personally insisted that such characters are licensed members of the Performers and Actors Guild in order to practice their trades throughout the majority of the district. If you immediately guessed that Always also happens to be the head of this guild, then congratulations! You are quickly learning how local politics usually functions here at the city at the centre of the world. Interestingly though, those armoured guardsmen you see there patrolling the marketplace are not actually members of the Thistle Guard. Those are rather members of the Brotherhood of Arbidar, a militant order of faithful operating in this area. The Brotherhood's primary function is to protect the Vault of Arbidar, which is that deity's most holy site and is located here in the Ivy District. However, they have also assumed an additional role as the district's true protectors, and have become quite popular with the locals. The Thistle Guard, being the Ivy District's official guard force, is always reluctant to intervene for any minor offences, as they are scared that drawing too much attention to crime will frighten tourists away from the area. They instead spend much of their time regulating street performers on behalf of the Nomarch. On the other hand, the Brotherhood is zealously strict in upholding all of the district's laws and regulations, 
This has led to some tension with the Thistles, but the Guardsmen have struggled to do much to stop the Brotherhood because, well, technically, they are not doing anything illegal, quite the reverse. While we're on the subject of conventions here in Absalom, let me point out to you these buildings on the left. As you have doubtless noticed, the city's buildings are almost always grouped together in roughly rectangular clusters demarcated by major roads. These do not all have official names, but those that do are often called blocks or wards, like an Anandari block from Westgate. Well, these constitute another one, the Arbor Ward. This is famous for its restaurants, which outnumber other buildings here two to one. In particular, Greenpike Lane, that runs down the middle of the block, boasts truly extravagant restaurants, while neighbouring Verdon Road is popular with tourists for its variety of hassle-free street food, though at peak times the vendors often set up shop here in the Flower Street Market instead. My personal recommendation for the ward is the Sanga Bistro, a Chelaxian restaurant themed after the Nine Layers of Hell. Chelyax, in case you weren't aware, is a troubled country to the northwest of Starstone Isle that has undergone a remarkable transformation into a devil worshipper's paradise in recent years, uh, but we will doubtless tour it still in good time. At the northern edge of the ward, just across from the park, is the Thistleguard's headquarters, somewhat uncreatively called Thistleguard Station. I think I was perhaps a bit too harsh on the guards before. I should stress that they are quick and eager to respond to any major, especially any violent, criminal activity within the district, and the detention centre is kept as clean and humane as possible. Prisoners here can be treated a little roughly, but always civilly. It is just that um, their treatment is selectively applied. Pickpockets, thieves and petty criminals are almost never pursued, and prosecuted only with the deepest reluctance if apprehended by another and brought to the station. I actually think most of this inactivity is due to the Nomarch's relentless pursuit of non-licensed street performers, who um, occupy much of the Thistle's time these days. Ah, now as we turn the corner and continue our journey eastwards, take a good look at that beautifully maintained green space to our right. That is the Ivy District Park, serving as a testament to what is possible when druids, leshies, and local government funding all come together and work in harmony. The trees there grow tall and proud, whether they be oaks, willows, pines, cedars, birches, firs, in short, all flora, including non-arboreal plant life. Meandering streams divide the park's generous and neat pathways, but magically sustained bridges ensure you need only the lightest footwear to enjoy a stroll. The animal life, too, is healthy and hearty, with a carefully curated ecosystem of squirrels, badgers, owls, frogs, ants, bees, birds, well, everything you imagine when you think of harmless tranquility in nature. Except for the squirrels, perhaps, because those things can be vicious. And at the centre of it all is a magically produced and maintained nine-foot-tall hedge maze that houses the world-famous Topiary Menagerie. Ah, well, that would be a macabre display of hedge trimmings, in case you didn't know. This building on the left, meanwhile, occupies neither the largest nor the most assuming spot in the district, though it is the most centrally located. It is without a doubt the most famous establishment of its kind in all Galarian. This is the Ivy Playhouse, home to the most extravagant, exciting, eccentric, and quite exquisite performances you will ever see. I would exhort you to attend at least one during your time here, but do be careful of the Brotherhood's most sensitive representatives harassing you en route. They find many of the performances to be morally ambiguous at best, and wholly irresponsible offences against the peace and good character of the district at worst. Turning our attention back to the park for a moment, I would encourage you to take note of this monumental and ancient oak grove coming up on our right. The grove is a shrine to Shailene, the goddess of art, beauty, love and music, so it is an important location to the district's artists, as you can imagine. At its heart lies an enchanted rose, suspended above a calm pond guarded by regal swans. 
The rose's petals change colour with the seasons, so currently they will be snow white. In a few weeks' time, though, they will transition literally overnight to a lusted yellow, heralding the arrival of the spring here in Absalom. This is one of the few places that escapes the noise of such a busy district. That building opposite the grove to our left is an example of something almost unique to Absalom. That is Tempest, a nightclub that opens its doors after sundown each day to offer strong drinks and loud music to people who enjoy the trance-like vigour of dancing in a large crowd. The walls inside are all impregnated with potent illusion magics that make the whole scene appear esoteric and uh, spaceless, for want of a better term. Uh, there is no need to imbibe mind-altering drugs like cut or grit when you spend time at Tempest. Above the club floor is an exclusive apartment suite owned by Absalom's foremost painter, the absurdist portrait artist called Einrock Bang. In his youth, he enjoyed public destruction of the wealthy's property, so it is something of an irony, perhaps lost to Tempest's elite patrons, that they are charged through the nose to visit his abode now. Well, I personally find Tempest too overwhelming and, frankly, expensive, but I will admit that it remains one of the most unique experiences available to you as a visitor to the city. Now, speaking of experts, this next crossroads hosts the armory of the master dwarven blacksmith, Engleton Embre. Though well into his geriatric days now, the old forge master's expert gaze supervises the work of his three prestigious apprentices, each of whom is probably superior to most other qualified blacksmiths in their own right. The arms and armour made here at Embry's armory is the stuff of status and legend. When abroad, you will often hear mercenaries boasting of their Absalom steel weapons, and they are all referring, truthfully or otherwise, to Master Embry. If you are looking for a better weapon yourself, I couldn't recommend any other smith, unless price were a top consideration, because with quality comes cost. Then again, why risk your life to an inferior blade? So Embry would say, in any case. Uh, we will be turning northwards again here, as we begin to loop back towards Flower Street and the western half of the district, but there remain two points of interest nearby that I would like to indicate to you. The first lies all the way down that road, nestled quite comfortably in the very southeast corner of the Ivy District. It is an extravagant restaurant known as the Golden Serpent. It occupies a building that the locals consider cursed with mercantile misfortune, given that the previous five restaurants that occupied the site went out of business with alarming rapidity. The Golden Serpent, though, seems to have shaken off such a curse, but they have paid a questionable price to do so. The restaurant serves only five-course meals with a focus on sapient creatures. Owl bears, manticles, krakens, even dragons have been known to its daily menus. Now, the outcry about this has fallen on deaf ears, well insulated by the overwhelmingly greater proportion of clientele who simply cannot resist the chance to consume the flesh of these creatures. Now, you ought to decide for yourself where you fall on this spectrum, but let me remind you that, for better or worse, the Golden Serpent is hardly the only restaurant engaged in this practice. To Eat the World and Westgate often serves similar meals, yet it is indisputably the fanciest. The second point of interest is purely geographical, in case you ever need to orient yourself in the Ivy District. Look for that imposing, quite out-of-character stone tower that dominates the eastern half of the area. That would be Arcarus Manor, home to another internationally famous painter called Endric Arcarus. I am fairly certain Endrick decided to construct his home on this side of the district because it is more visible and closer to the lavish buildings of the Ascendant Court, but who am I to judge? Uh, passing us on the left now is a block that uh, shields the Ivy District's distinct courthouse from view. Uh, indeed, compared to the grandeur of Westgate's courthouse, this one is almost unnoticeable. Uh, it is certainly unremarkable. So unremarkable, in fact, 
that justice is sometimes dispensed outside of the actual building, which is in desperate need of renovation. Thus, watching Ivy District trials is a spectacle not for the rather plain proceedings of judicial assessment, but for the dozens and dozens of street performers who attend in an attempt to disrupt or support the cases of interests to them. We are about to head uh, westwards again, but as we do, note that there are two religious sites over there to the northeast, bordering the Wise Quarter. The closer of the two is the House of Healing, a large temple to Sarenrae, easily recognisable by the gorgeous, swirling murals that adorn its outer walls. The policy of the clergy therein is totally indiscriminate. Free healing and succour to all who request it, no questions asked. It is just about the only place in the whole city where you are likely to find unlicensed actors, thistle guards, and brothers of Arbadar coexisting peacefully together. While neutral parties in conflicts like this always attract a degree of enmity, the temple has so far proven to be far too useful to disrupt seriously, with occasional vandals drawing universal condemnation from locals, for whom beauty is politics. The House of Healing also champions the plight of Absalom's poorer districts, displaying an enthusiasm for other parts of the city almost unheard of here. You may recall from my Puddles tour that a healing raft bearing a priest for the distressed and soup for the hungry is dispatched along its flooded pathways each day, and they originate from the House of Healing. The second religious site uh, lies just a little eastwards of the first. It is the one building I do regret not being able to show you in person, but desperately encourage you to visit on your own time after my route completes. I am referring to the Vault of Arbadar, a magnificent piece of architecture giving the illusion of an unbalanced tower wrought in domineering darkwood. Yet despite its appearance, the vault lives up to its name as one of the most secure places to store possessions in the entire city, possibly the entire region. As well as being a temple to the god of cities, the vault is also a merchant bank operated by its high priestess and local counsellor, Jostlin Ferkir. In partial recompense for not being able to take you there myself, allow me to recount for you a curious local tale about the priestess and her role in the Ivy District's politics. You see, for the longest time, the balance of power between the Nomarch and the Brotherhood, represented by Jostlin on the District Council, was perfectly maintained. Elaine Always, stranglehold over performers only solidified a few years ago, after the High Priestess suddenly retreated into the vault and almost never emerged to attend meetings. With the chain of influence broken, the Nomarch was able to aggregate his assets and more effectively exert his will. So this begs the question, what changed? I think I have the answer. Around this time, it was discovered that the third keeper of the vault, Meridane Velric, had been murdered. And what's more, she had been murdered over three years ago. Someone had been impersonating her, with full access to the vault's vaults in the meantime. As you might expect, this was humiliating to the High Priestess, who immediately instigated a full investigation of the incident, including a full inventory of goods. The results of this were never released to the public, but I happen to know from a talkative detective Thistle, who worked on the murder component of the investigation, that a great deal of wealth was sequestered by the guilty party who, by the way, was never caught. Should the full inventory be released to the public, I expect that the economy of this city would contract significantly, because everyone who is anyone maintains a good portion of their wealth in the Vault of Arbadar. Incidentally, this incredible wealth is what saved the bank. A single emptied account belonging to the wrong noble would have caused the most incredible brouhaha. But what's a few dozen platinum to the rich? Skimming a little bit of everyone generated equivalent wealth with far less alarm. Not a bad scheme, if I do say so myself. Remember that I promised to explain a student's quite minimalistic garb at the beginning of the tour? Well, now is the time. The building up to the north there, grand yet lonely, is the White Grotto, a manor house turned music school. The academy is divided into five areas of expertise, voice, drum, string, pipe and script, 
and all students are expected to become accomplished in all of these critical areas. Those simple coloured tunics, often worn as short dresses without trousers or hose in accordance with their fashion, indicate a student's rank within the grotto. The greens are the most common, being humble apprentices, while the significantly less humble blues are journeymen. A black tunic indicates a master student, which I admit is quite the paradoxical term. Besides the manor, the White Grotto also boasts several amphitheatres of varying sizes. However, the students are rarely content staying on site for long, and you will find them frequenting the district's bars, clubs and entertainment venues at all hours. Indeed, they are actually encouraged to do this, for the Academy pays the District Council a significant sum of money each year to obtain blanket approval for student performances without licences or additional fees. Some more wily students do their best to remain enrolled for as long as possible to extend this benefit, for it is an emotional boon to the budding performer, especially in an area as saturated with impoverished artists as this. As we approach uh, Flower Street again, I would like to quickly point out to you uh, this building to our right. Uh, it is called the Chamber Grove, and it is the seat of the District Council here in the Ivy District. Uh, there is nothing especially notable about it, save that it is a converted amphitheatre. But then again, that is hardly surprising here. What is more interesting to me is the leshy maintained natural amphitheatre right behind it, called the Wandering Monster. Due to a loophole in the law, this sunken area of land surrounded by conveniently carved verges and logs is not officially registered as a performance space, and so no license is required to put on a show there. Of course, the Thistle Guard tries to prohibit performances anyway, which invariably leads to clashes with the Brotherhood, meaning that the Wandering Monster is perfect for viewing the more rough-and-tumble, risque shows currently on scene. If you perform and catch the attention of the Nomarch, though, uh, you will find yourself blacklisted from other official stages, so the majority of shows offered at the Wandering Monster are undertaken in masquerade style. It is quite popular by night. The show must go on at all hours of the day here in the Ivy District. Uh, now here, just opposite these locales, on the crossroads with Flower Street, lies the mysterious and fiercely berumored Bloom Cabaret. Its performances, if it even has any, are private and confidential, for membership to the cabaret is invitation only and reserved for the district's elite. I admit that um, even I do not know too much about it. However, I can tell you that it sponsors a few lucky artists each year, paying generous commissions to create artwork, music and theatre disparaging the Brotherhood of Arbadar in a satirical manner. It may be a front for the Nomarch, but I do not think this very likely. I mean, his rivalry with the Brotherhood is public already. Using a secret society to further an identical goal seems pointless. So I instead proffer that it is run by wealthy patrons, perhaps partially from out of district, who wish to support organised theatre at all costs. We have now crossed Flower Street again, there it is, and are beginning to loop around, uh, back to the border with Westgate. Um, on our right are the abodes of the wealthiest inhabitants of the whole district, which I would like to indicate to you momentarily. But first, turn your head south and try to spot through the buildings the unmistakably delicate, arcing, Castrovellian architecture of Elysia's, an art gallery and tea room located in the heart of the district proper. You would be forgiven for thinking that Castrovel was a country, my friend, but oh no, Castrovel is a planet, millions of miles away in the night sky. It is a neighbour to Galarian, our planet, and some scholars swear blind that it houses the origin of all elven kind. Well, I do not know if that is true, but coming back to the Ivy District, I can tell you that Elysia's gallery houses testaments to elves and Castrovel in all its forms. Viewing is expensive though, so do not bother showing your face around there unless you can boast deep pockets. Now, on to the manors. The first one on our right is Dacalane Manor, an impressive and stout four-storey building overseen by Lady Miranda Dacalane, trusted friend to the Pathfinder Society. 
You see, the society's influence runs everywhere once you go looking for it. In this case, Lady Dacolaine has generously supported its efforts uh, ever since her son, Jay, was miraculously found alive by Pathfinder agents a full decade after the earthquake of 4698 decimated the precipice quarter, then called Beldrin's Bluff. I actually think that Jay himself went on to become an agent for the Pathfinders, so it has proved to be a symbiotic relationship. This next manor is Starspine, and it belongs to the legendary arcanist Daedalos the Magnificent. I will let you infer what you will about him with a name like that, but his achievements within the district are more to do with socialising than with magic. For Daedalos throws the biggest and best party of the district on the 17th of Erastus each year in the height of summer, receiving an invitation to Starspine Manor which is usually so elegantly shielded from view by the extensive garden's meticulously maintained hedgerows, represents the height of influence here in the Ivy District. Sneaking into manor grounds to attend the party even without an invitation is also the quest of literally every student in the White Grotto, uh, who find the combination of blowout parties and the potential for rich patronage unbearably alluring. The third manor is actually an embassy maintained by the Elven Kingdom of Caonan, uh, located on the eastern edge of Lake Encarthen in the area known as the Shining Lands, far to the north of Kortos. Uh, given the significant Elven population of the Ivy District relative to um, other areas of the city, it is hardly surprising that the Caonan Embassy is located here. Caonan is a fascinating and beautiful land, and I recommend you travel there at least once before you depart Galarian, if you get the chance. A word to the wise, though. The Kionan elves really do not enjoy the company of non-elves, so travel with caution. Ah, now as we round the corner and head southwards again, let me point out to you this small and quite unassuming glassblower's shop called Crystal Creations. I freely admit that glass blowing may be a more lucrative business here in the Ivy District than elsewhere in Absalom, what with the constant demand for creative and original uses of materials and performances and artistic displays, but I do not think this quite justifies the hubbub of activity that constantly hums around its doors. I have been led to believe that the basement of this fine establishment connects to a networked series of ancient tunnels which possibly offer a discreet route out of the city, should you ever need it. Of course, it is evident by the shiftiness of those characters that this secret is known to the local thieves' guild as well, so you will probably have to pay for the luxury of using it, or risk the wrath of the Crown Swarm, as they are known. And of course, if you do need some classwork modelled, uh, Crystal Creations is a well-maintained business in its own right too. Meanwhile, this block on our left is the nesting site of the Gutless Griffin, the Ivy District's most welcoming inn. The innkeep is one Fronzak Shim, a gentleman of fiercely rowdy reputation. The Griffin is his establishment, no doubt about it, and it reflects Shim's preferences completely. Namely, roaring hearth fires, daily performances from bards and storytellers, endlessly flowing mead and merriment, and an atmosphere so jovial and so lively that patrons never mind that they are often forced to sit shoulder to shoulder with strangers. The warmth of the Griffin has made it extremely popular with locals and tourists alike, which has naturally drawn the scrutiny of the Brotherhood, but even their zeal is softened by the vibrance of the place. It is an open secret here in the Ivy District that there is considerable hostility between Shim and the Nomarch, which has only been heightened since the former's appointment to the Low Council. Nevertheless, the two politicians stay out of one another's way, and uh, the Thistle Guards will never disrupt performances, licensed or not, that take place within the Griffin's walls. In fact, I imagine most of them come here off duty to enjoy them. And now, finally, as we approach this corner and prepare to reach the Flower Street Market again, let me tell you a little about this street that we are currently driving along. This is Sundown Street, a fitting name for the last stop on our tour. It houses, literally side by side, three of the most prolific and famous tailors in the entire Inner Sea region. Ambrose Black, Al-Amir Kai, and Madame Theodora Te Signe. 
Fashion is almost as popular as art here in the Ivy District, and the clothing you encounter you'll not find anywhere else in the city. Thousand-year-old fads are constantly being revived and repopularized here, with the um, eclectic mixture of style only contributing to the unique culture of the district and the city as a whole. The big three tailors do not sully themselves with such petty distractions, though. Instead, they advertise to only the most expensive clients, who are happy to rate their turn for months to receive their perfect article of clothing. Competition is so high that um, monetary compensation is normally not enough. The tailors frequently demand political or social favours in return for their services. Luckily for the rest of us, though, the remaining shops on Sundown Street are nowhere near as picky and preferential. While still quite expensive, anyone should be able to find themselves better dressed after a visit to this road's boutiques. Well, have I whet your appetite for the arts and high society? I should hope so. There is no shame in exploring the opulent side of life for a little while, and the Ivy District is one of the few parts of the city that I can say truly is not rife with corruption and danger beyond the usual local squabbles. This does mark the end of uh, my tour here, uh, but there is still much of the city at the centre of the world to see. My next destination will be the Wise Quarter, which begins at the high end of this street. Uh, it seems the sun is beginning its downward journey, so let us meet there two hours after sundown, once it falls quieter. As you can probably infer from the name, the Wise Quarter is the home to the majority of learning and academic inquiry in the city and it also houses the Grand Council itself. So, once the students have returned to their desks and the politicians to their back rooms, we will be able to tour the area in relative peace. I do hope to see you there. Until then.